everybody. So today I'd like to talk to you about um, the differential form of Newton's second law. And then from that, we're going to derive the expression for impulse. And this covers sections 2.1 and 2.2 in your Matter and Interactions textbook. So <clears throat> we talked about in a previous lecture, Newton's second law as F equals MA, the mass times the acceleration, and F is the force. But Newton's second law can be used to relate the momentum of a particle to the resultant force acting on it if the mass is constant. Also, in terms of this expression, the net force, or the sum of the forces, and remember force is a vector, is going to be equal to the change in momentum, delta P, over the change in time, delta T. Now, remember that the momentum is the mass times the velocity. So let's say that you've got velocities at time T1 and T2, of uh, v1 and v2. So your change in momentum would be mv2 minus mv1 over your delta t, or m delta v over delta t. And since the definition of the average acceleration is delta v over delta t, it can be written as ma. So you can see that the uh, f equals ma form of Newton's second law is equivalent to saying that it's equal to the change in momentum over the change in time if you have a situation where you have a constant mass. So you could also express this as the time rate of change of the linear momentum of a particle is equal to the net force acting on the particle. It's a little less familiar than F equals MA, which is how a lot of textbooks, introductory textbooks, refer to Newton's second law. But in fact, F is equal to delta P over delta T is the form in which Newton presented the second law. And it's a more general form than F equals to MA because it also allows for changes in mass. Now, if you take the limit of the change in momentum over the change in time, delta P over delta T, as the change in time goes to zero, then you end up with the differential form of Newton's second law. F is equal to dP dt. Now, of course, that's uh, F that I'm talking about is the net force, which is the sum of all the forces acting on the particle. Okay? So you could write it as F net equals dP dt, which is the differential form of Newton's second law. So when I say it's more general, and I say that it means that the mass doesn't have to be constant when expressed in this way, what I mean is that if you take dp dt and you realize that p is equal to mv, then you can express it as m dv dt, or ma, right? But then also, if the mass changes, then you would have on this second term, plus dm dt times v. So it's a more general form if the mass isn't constant. And in fact, the change in mass with the change in time, that's what makes rockets go which is a whole nother lecture. But basically the idea is that you're burning the mass, which kicks the exhaust out the back of the rocket, which causes the thrust, which is what causes a rocket to go. Now note that your matter and interactions textbook often refers to Newton's second law as the momentum principle. But look, I can't do that, sorry. Um, I've been teaching physics for about 15 or 16 years now by calling it Newton's second law and I'm just not going to be able to switch. But realize that when you're reading your Matter and Interactions textbook, they often talk about Newton's second law, calling it the momentum principle. Now, during a collision, like, say, for example, we have this picture here where the tennis racket is hitting the tennis ball. So in that kind of um, collision, the tennis racket is imparting a great deal of force to the tennis ball. And oftentimes this happens during a collision and it causes objects to deform or get smashed or rearranged due to the large forces involved. Now, if you wanted to quantify how much those forces are during that collision, then it might be useful to express the force in a slightly different way. So here we have, of course, from Newton's second law, F is equal to delta P over delta T, but we could also rearrange that equation and multiply delta T times both sides. And then we would have F times delta T is equal to delta P. This is an expression that's often uh, referred to as the impulse. The impulse is equal to F times delta T. Now, the units of impulse, as you can see, would be a force times a time, which is Newton's times seconds. What we're going to do in a lot of this, and it goes along with what you're going to see in um, Chapter 2 of Matter and Interactions, is we're going to assume that the collision occurs over a very short time. And if that's the case, then we can just approximate the force on the object during the collision or whatever causes it 
um, to be an average force, some constant value. Now, it might not actually be that way, and that's shown here in this graph. Let's say that your force is some kind of time dependence. It's not just a constant all throughout the time of the collision, but maybe it looks like it does in this pink curve here where it, it goes up, peaks, and then comes back down. But what we can do is if delta t is small, we can just kind of box it off, right? And say, okay, well, the time rate, uh, the time that the collision lasts, for example, is delta t here. And we can just approximate it as this f average, and we'll get the same answer. Okay, so this is the approximation that we're going to use for a lot of this chapter. Now what the impulse tells us is that we can get the same change in momentum with a large force acting for a short time or a small force acting for a longer time. Okay, let's say for example though that you're in a car and you're going through some kind of collision which causes your car to go to 45 miles per hour to a dead stop, right? Well, if you had a large force acting for a short time, you might crush your skull, right? And when I say a large force for a short time, imagine what would happen if your skull collided with the steering column. That's a very large force for a very short time. But what you can do is lengthen out the time of the collision by putting in something like an airbag. If that's the case, then it reduces the average amount of force on your skull, and you might actually live through that collision. So that's why airbags save lives. And it's also why boxers wear gloves in the ring, right? If you have a cushy glove hitting your face instead of just a hard fist, maybe you, your face doesn't look quite as rearranged as this guy's right here. It's also why if you jump down from a hot height, you're, you should squat and save your knees by bending them and flexing them as you land. Let's do an example problem with impulse. In this example problem, we'll read it together. We have a three kilogram steel ball and it strikes a wall with a speed of 10 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees to the wall. It bounces off with the same speed and the same angle. If the ball is in contact with the wall for 0.2 seconds, what would you approximate as the average force exerted on the wall? Okay? So remember that whenever you're faced with a physics problem, a nice thing to do, first of all, is to draw yourself a picture. So here, I've shown you a picture. Here's the wall, this box right here, and then my ball is coming in, bouncing off the wall, and going out. Now it's a 60 degree angle that it makes with the wall, as you can see here. I've chosen a coordinate system, which is going to be centered at where the collision is on the wall. I shifted it over here so you could see it easier, but basically the plus x sticks out of the wall and the plus y goes up the wall. And the origin would be right here where the collision happens. Okay, so after you draw yourself a picture, which is very helpful, you need to identify your knowns. In this case, the knowns are the momentum, right? So you can figure out what the momentum is both before and after the collision because it tells you, right, that your three kilogram steel, uh, steel ball has a speed of 10 meters per second and also gives you the angle. So since momentum is a vector, you can take the mass, three kilograms, times the speed, 10 meters per second, and then figure out what the components of your momentum vector are from the 60 degrees. So I've shown you that here. Here you have x components and y components of your initial and your final momentum. Let's break down the initial um, momentum first. So here I have p initial in the x is equal to the mass times the initial velocity in the x direction. Okay. So the mass is three kilograms, I've put that in. The initial velocity in the x direction is pointing in the negative x direction because it's pointing up and to the left. And remember, left in this coordinate system is negative. So that's why I have that minus sign out front. Now, my velocity vector will be my speed, and then I'll take the x component of that, right, x component of my velocity, right? So that's gonna be 10 meters per second. Now, since my angle is with respect to the y axis here, then that means that for my x component, I have to use the sine of 60, okay? So if you can envision a little right triangle right here where the momentum or the velocity vector here is the arrow, right? Here's my 60 degrees right here. Then my x component would be the line that connects the ball to the wall horizontally, okay? So you can see that that component there is opposite my 60 degree angle, which is why I use my sign. Okay, so I have minus three kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60. That gives me my initial X momentum. 
Similarly, for my y, what I've got is my mass times my initial velocity in the y. Now, my initial velocity in the y points up, okay, and that's the plus y. So I have a positive sign right here. But otherwise, it looks very similar. 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second my speed. Now, for my y component, I'm going to use the cosine of 60. Because, of course, if I use the sine of 60 for my x component, I would have to use the cosine of 60 for my y. Okay, so that gives me the initial components of my momentum in both the x and the y. Now let's look at the final momentum. Let's do the x component first. Now this time, my ball is traveling up and to the right. So that's in both the plus x and plus y directions. Similarly to last time, my x component I'm going to use and solve by finding the sine of 60 here. Okay, so m times the uh, x component of my velocity is going to be th 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60 degrees, okay? Because my x component is opposite this 60 degree angle right here. Okay, next, my y component of my momentum. 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the cosine of 60, because if I use the sine of 60 for x, I use the cosine for y. So yet again, it's traveling upwards. So in that case, I've chosen up to be plus y, so it's positive. So that's all my momenta, okay? Now what we're going to do is, those are all my knowns, and I'm going to use the equation for um, impulse here, right? And my impulse is equal to my change in my momentum. Impulse is a vector because it's equal to f average times delta t, and f is a vector, and also p is a vector, and the impulse is equal to delta p. So here we have the impulse is equal to delta p, which is equal to f average delta t. Since they're vectors, I'm going to take and analyze them component-wise, okay? So I've got my impulse, right? I'm going to set that equal to my change in my momentum in the x direction. Now, I've already solved for my final and my initial momentum in x. So my delta px, which is the x component of my impulse, is just p final x minus p initial x, which is, plugging in, 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60, minus negative 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60. So that ends up giving me 2 times 3 times 10 times the sine of 60. And when you plug that into your calculator, you get 52 kilograms meters per second, or if you'd like, Newton seconds, okay? All right, now the change in momentum in the y direction is p final on the y minus p initial on the y, and that's equal to my impulse in the y direction. So that's equal to plugging in. 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the cosine of 60 minus 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the cosine of 60. That gives me zero. Or in other words, since the y component of my momentum, excuse me, the y component of my momentum doesn't change, right? So that means I've got no net impulse in the y direction. Okay. So my delta p is equal to f average times delta t. So now I can use that equation to solve for the average force experienced by the ball during the collision. And what I would do is I would just take my um, F, which would be equal to my delta P, over my delta T. So that's in the X direction, 52 kilogram meters per second divided by, by the time of the collision, which is 0.2 seconds. And that gives me 260 newtons. Now, the y component of my uh, force would be zero because there's no change in my mo uh, momentum in the y direction, okay? So that's how to use impulse in a uh, problem. I hope you understood that. If not, please do ask me questions, and I'll see you in class.